Welcome everybody to Land of Futurists. My name's David Wood. It's my pleasure and privilege to have been chairing meetings of Land of Futurists for, as it turns out, almost exactly 10 years. And before I introduce today's speaker, Dr. Anders Sandberg, talking about grand futures, I just want to mention very quickly about 10 years ago, the very first event that some of us uh, organized in this building, in this series. It was a bit of a smaller room, a smaller gathering. I don't have exact records, but I think there's probably about a dozen people there. And on that occasion, we had uh, three speakers. There's uh, Ben Zybok, myself, and somebody called Anders Sandberg. And we were talking about uh, changing the public mood and mind in Britain regarding radical futures. What could we hope to accomplish in the next four years? What could we do to make people more receptive to radical, uh, techno-progressive and transhumanist ideas? Fascinating. Anders was reasonably well known at that time and he has the, since then become a highly regarded as one of the most profound and interesting thinkers about all aspects of the future. He's been based at the uh, Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford for most of these 10 years and has a life before that in Sweden, where he grew up and uh, studied, amongst other things, computational neurology, computational neuroscience. So he'll say a little bit more about that when he speaks. London Futurist tries to make people think a little bit further into the future. Quite often when I engage as a consultant, I'm trying to make people think about scenarios for maybe three to five or even ten years in the future, and I know what they're really hoping that I'll tell them is how they can increase the bottom line uh, in the next quarter or maybe the quarter after that. So they're focusing maybe on 10% uh, improvements over 10 months, and I'm trying to get them to think about 10 times improvements over possibility of five or 10 years. And the argument is that if we stretch our minds by thinking about these longer term futures, it gives us a whole new perspective. It's like going to the gym, you get your mus muscles stretched and then they relapse, but you end up fitter and more able to tackle the present than before. So that's what London Futurist has been about, not what's in the next iPhone or what we might we expect in the next uh, political speech, but trying to look at radical scenarios for about 10 years into the future. But today we're doing something different. We're not looking at possible futures 10 years ahead. We're looking 10 to the power of 10 years or more into the future. We're not just looking at the possibilities of humanity being maybe 10 times as capable and 10 times as powerful, 10 times as productive, 10 times as fulfilled as we are today, but possibly 10 to the 10 times more fulfilled and uh, smarter and so on. I'm not sure if that's exact right numbers. It may not be 10 to the 10. It might be 10 to the 13 or 10 to the 7, but what's a few powers of 10? Higher, well, don't want to give away all too many secrets. So what's the point of thinking so far ahead? Well. It's my observation that when people reach a deeper understanding of the overall cosmic trajectory, sometimes it causes them to reevaluate what they're doing in the short term as well. Sometimes when we see the grander possibilities for ourselves and for humanity of which we are part, it causes us a new thought patterns and we change what we do in the present too. So that's what we're going to look at here. Uh, one of the possibly great futures for humanity and the descendants of humanity, whether we call them post-humans or transhumans, what are also the big risks that will prevent us from achieving these grand futures? And finally, bearing all that in mind, what might we do differently in the next 10 months, next 10 weeks, next 10 days, or next 10 hours with that new perspective? So let's welcome to the stage Dr. Anders Sandberg. Thank you, David. It's always fun to be up here. And uh, it's particularly fun right now because the, I'm actually supposed to be doing this. As some of you know, I have a long-suffering boss who is trying to get me to work on what I'm supposed to work on. And uh, for you, those of you who have heard my various talks, you know that I'm working on a lot of uh, different things. And very few of them actually conform to what uh, Andrew wants me to work on. However, Right now, we're totally aligned. I'm working on a book on grand futures. Andrew is kind of giving it uh, his blessing. And he's very happy that I'm giving a talk here because that forced me to kind of work out some stuff so I have something to tell you, which is very practical for everybody. Except, of course, that this is still a work in progress. 
it's going to be a work in progress for quite some time. So you're getting to see uh, a relatively early stage. Hopefully the book will be done on this time of a technological singularity. But uh, we'll see. But what is a grand future? So my idea about this is that uh, we quite often think about futures. And some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them are way better or worse than others. Transhumanism typically tends to look at the more extreme tales of this distribution, while the standard future involves a little bit more pollution and climate change and then jetpacks and flying cars. It's essentially envisioned as the current and uh, nothing has really changed. Transhumanism says that, yeah, it could be that humanity is dead or that we have changed the human condition. Grand Futures is about looking at what happens if we get our act together. I will talk, at least in the beginning of my talk, a bit about threats to our species and our future. And then get into the question, just how much could be won if we actually get our act together? Whatever getting our act together actually means, which is another very important research topic. So Grand Futures is really about looking at the biggest possible in the future we can imagine, including, of course, the question what actually makes them big. So without further ado, let's go back uh, to the Big Bang, or at least trying to think about big history. So big history is a bit of a movement that has started by the historian David Christian that points out that we're typically talking about history in the wrong way. We're separating that from astronomy, from chemistry, from paleontology. They're all different subjects. But we all deal with the same topic, the world and how it has been and how it's changing over that time. So his idea was let's bring it together and actually have a curriculum. So this is mostly an educational idea. Uh, that actually integrates it, points out that the reason Russia is like it is today is partially because of geography and the history, and that geography was set by geology and the uh, ecology that emerged on Earth as life emerged. And the reason Earth is like it is has various astronomical reasons. You can go back and forth between these different levels, from the Big Bang to the questions about what are we actually doing in the foreign policy today. So I think this is a very valuable approach, actually. You should be able to zoom in and zoom out, and also be aware that the deep history is shaping us. You can make an argument that uh, the reason the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain was the easy access to coal. Why was there easy access to coal? Well, there was the Carboniferous swamps uh, a few hundred million years around, uh, ago around here that then got nicely buried under that shallow sea uh, during uh, the era of the dinosaurs uh, um, that turned into sandstone. And uh, well, that led to a lot of coal. So many of the historical aspects have deeper aspects going back in, in, deep into history. And understanding deep history might tell us something interesting about our current uh, situations. Qu current questions about climate change and, uh, and uh, fossil fuels, for example. Similarly, we might want to go forward in time and think about our future this way. So you can make various graphs kind of trying to get the history of the universe together with the history of Earth, the history of life on Earth, and then move forward uh, where you have uh, the uh, early humans and the ancient history and all the way over to the United Nations and uh, our current uh, world power. And generally, this kind of story tends to turn into a lot of exponential graphs. So by the way, our world in data is one of the most wonderful projects we have uh, around Oxford right now at the Oxford Martin School. They're basically trying to get good data, curate it, and make it freely available on the web so you can have good resources about what is the actual state of the world or how, how has it changed. So here is an estimate of world population, and uh, it basically was very low for a long time, and then it turns exponential relatively recently. Here is a slightly shorter graph, but in this case, it's how much uh, money per capita um, uh, people have in Britain. And again, it's amazingly flat, and then it turns exponential. There was a growth going on even in the Middle Ages. Uh, these kind of graphs, of course, are always a bit treacherous. You might want to put, put them on a log scale to see whether the growth rate changes. But I think one of the more important stories here is, yeah, it's been relatively steadily going up despite wars, pestilence, and disasters, despite the society changing tremendously over time. My friend Luke Mulhauser did a wonderful diagram where he put together apples and oranges like crazy. So 
here are a lot of very different you know, things put on the same graph. So the, the light blue one is a life expectancy, which for a uh, long time was very low, and then really took off when we got modern medicine. Uh, the black line, that is GDP per capita, I think this is worldwide. Again, you get this dr very dramatic exponential. Uh, you got this uh, graph about the extreme poverty, and uh, you have other about how much energy we have, and unfortunately also things like war making capacity, which is, uh, I think, measured in how many people you can kill per hour per, for a given amount of resources. Unfortunately, that one is also going up exponentially. And uh, basically, we can plot a lot of graphs together here, and they're going up very strongly. And he, one of his points was the Industrial Revolution actually was a big deal. When you think about what has actually changed in the human condition, if you're not listing the, uh, the Industrial Revolution and the changes it seems to have enabled, you're kind of missing one of the really, really big events. Another important lesson is a lot of horrible disasters have happened and they actually didn't budge these curves very much, which is actually very, very good news uh, because that suggests that we're a bit more resilient than we thought, or at least we have been more resilient. We might wonder if we will remain resilient. Because, of course, one problem is that we're not terribly much smarter now than we were really far in the past. So this is one of my standard pictures in my presentation. I think humanity right now is a little bit like the monkey in the high voltage cabinet. We have created this wonderful world containing amazing things and colorful things and buttons that might uh, serve your soda or launch a missile. And our wisdom has not really grown that much. I do think there have been actually some intellectual and even moral progress, but not that much. We are smart, and on average I think we are smarter than we were in the past because of good nutrition, education, and a few other effects. But we're not super geniuses compared to the ancient Romans or the Stone Age people. And this means that we might actually be in a rather dangerous predicament. Because now we have the capability to changing our life conditions rather strongly in ways we are not fully in control over and we might not be very good at handling. So one way of thinking about this very, very big picture is of course to say, yep, if th this is some kind of human value, you, some scale of positive stuff, and exactly how to evaluate that is of course going to keep us very busy in the philosophy department, whatever it is that truly counts. So far, it's been going up roughly exponentially. Now, the interesting question here is, where do, are we going from here? So there is one possibility that we totally flub it and go extinct. Uh, there is uh, various scenarios about, well, maybe we, this is the peak. This is the best humanity ever will get, and now it's just downhill and we're going down to some low level. Or maybe this is actually what it's going to be like. So forever it's going to be essentially fast food and the cars and uh, the soap operas. Although soap operas from a future civilization, tens of thousands of years in the future, but still soap operas. Or maybe we are going to go up. Exactly what these trajectories even mean is actually a quite interesting research topic that I'm working on uh, a paper about. It's also an interesting question which one we actually believe are serious possibilities. I do think we can agree that extinction actually is a real possibility. And I think at least in this room we can think that yeah, going up very far, even if that's not going to go up infinitely, is also very, uh, very possible. I'm a bit more doubtful actually about the permanent mid-level and per permanent low level. Uh, so the middle level thing, imagine McDonald's for tens of thousands, millions of years. Does that make sense? Uh, obviously, we can't have a civilization running for a million years on fossil fuels, but let's suppose it's all solar powered and sustainable. Would we still believe that civilization could just stay within the same level? It could remain a, sta in a stable society or a series of stable societies that don't go and become something else? That seems very odd, actually. Certainly, we can imagine something like ancient Egypt uh, that was remarkably similar over thousands of years. But that was a relatively in a, a small region with a fairly simple approach to how you could uh, feed yourself. There was not much point in changing <laughs> things around. It's a bit less clear that you could reach that level of stasis on uh, a lar large scale globally. People are getting ideas. If we look at many of the big conflicts and things that have changed the world, there have not been so much technologies as weird ideas people have gotten about religion, about philosophy, about how to distribute uh, money. 
and they have driven an awful lot of history. Uh, so I do think if, you know, when Francis Fukuyama said the end of history uh, had occurred, he, of course, everybody likes to slam him because he was uh, obviously wrong. Uh, but his problem there was he couldn't foresee a challenge to liberal democracy, even though those challenges that were showing up uh, in the 90s already were well known. I think it's pretty clear that even if you have just one system, people are going to be good at coming up with other systems. So it's a bit unclear whether you can maintain that permanent mid-level. Also, it needs to be able to survive a lot of cosmic uh, disasters. Similarly, the permanent low level is an interesting one. If we flub it and the civilization collapses and when the, our, the survivors become hunter-gatherers, it's not inconceivable that it might take a long time to build a technological civilization. It certainly did it in the past. It took, uh, it took uh, hundreds of thousands of years to uh, invent agriculture and tens of thousands of years of agriculture before we got an industrial revolution. However, it's not clear that it would take uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of years to reinvent agriculture if you see the remnants of agriculture around you, if there are at least some crops left over and people know in, uh, in uh, ancient stories uh, about planting food. If you have the remnants of an industrial civilization around, it seems much easier to reboot it. You might make arguments here about energy availability and uh, fossil fuels, etc. But I think we're beside the point. It's not clear at all that this is a stable state. I, uh, David Christian and me had this argument, uh, and we both more or less agree that, yeah, it's probably unstable to be hunter-gatherers. You can be that for hundreds of thousands of years, but sooner or later somebody will plant something in the ground and you get agriculture, and bam, you have an industrial revolution, and whatever <laughs> happens afterwards. So, these two branches, I'm not going to deal much with them here. I think they are um, relatively interesting to try to understand, but I don't think they're very likely. On the other hand, of course, extinction is pretty common. Most species have gone extinct in the past, including some of our seedling species that we now find uh, over in museums. Um, and generally, of course, existential risk is uh, something that we need to uh, care about. It's not just about extinction. It can also be that we somehow manage to wreck our future so much that we rather wish we didn't have a future. Uh, so you can imagine something that is both pan-generational in scope or uh, and, uh, either hellish in intensity or crushing. You could imagine maybe that you could do something even worse that actually wrecks the universe. There are some interesting possibilities about vacuum decay in that regard. Uh, now, existential risk, there are various kinds of them. And I'm going to just quickly run through it uh, because most of you probably have heard most of them. So the astronomical ones are the grand ones. Uh, so you have supernovas, but they only seem to cause mass extinctions about once every 180 million years or so. So they're relatively rare. They're not a problem for us right now under our normal timescales of futurism. Solar eruptions is actually something we need to worry about a fair bit more because we are dependent on a power grid that's actually quite sensitive. And things like the Carrington event uh, in the 1850s that actually uh, caused sparks to fly from the telegraph wires would today probably make a lot of power grids fail. And given that Wall Street, the richest part of Earth's surface, couldn't get a transformer for two weeks after Hurricane Sandy, imagine this on a global scale. That could be very bad. Not necessarily existential, but it could wreck a lot of what we built up and make us vulnerable for other threats. And then, of course, we got the charismatic megafauna of all existential risk, asteroid impacts. They make so good pictures. <laughs> and actually, in, uh, the Earth impactors are probably the best managed existential risk we have right now. Uh, we understand what it's about. We have a community working hard on uh, fixing it. We have observed the uh, dangerous objects. We have a system for it. We haven't got a great mitigation strategy, but it's also pretty unlikely that we need it. So this is the best handled risk, which makes that community very sad when I tell them that, because they feel like they're underfunded and nobody's listening to them. But the problem is, of course, the other community dealing with many of these risks are e even worse underfunded. and. Uh, they have even less idea about what to do about it. But generally, the astronomical risks are not much of a threat to us uh, humans. Um, overall, per century, uh, the risk of us going extinct because of this is pretty uh, minimal. <coughs> we also have geophysical risks. Most of the standard risks are, of course, uh, garden variety and, um, and uh, disasters, which are locally very bad and uh, might uh, put the resilience of a society under a lot of strain. 
but on a larger scale, of course, we need to deal with the fact that our interglacial is going to come to an end at some point. After all, we're living right in the middle of an ice age. Might be hard to believe even though it's uh, February, but um, for the past uh, 10,000 years we have had this wonderful intermission of the uh, uh, polar ice and uh, we actually have uh, nice balmy temperatures. Now the good news is according to most models I've seen, it actually looks likely that this even naturally would probably last at least 10,000 years more perhaps even 20 or 30,000 years. And we're of course doing something with uh, the greenhouse gases that might actually make it last much longer. Uh, we're rather uncertain about the science here, so uh, one should take it with a grain of salt. And also the, uh, the polar ice caps are not going to kind of come knocking on our doors instantly. We're gonna have a bit of warning uh, that we need to do something if they happen. Supervolcanoes is another interesting and charismatic form of disaster that could actually cause a climate change over maybe a decade or two that really impairs agriculture globally and that could lead to a very big disaster. But again, they occur only about once every 100,000 years, so uh, the risk is relatively minor. We're also very fortunate that uh, the Yellowstone cal caldera is right in the middle of a national park most Americans have visited. So Americans are really, really into supervolcanoes and think that it's really cool to fund research about it and keep an eye on that supervolcano. So this is again one that is at least being studied well, even though we don't have a really good idea about how to handle supervolcanoes. Probably the smartest way is uh, to think about alternatives to our current form of agriculture. There is wonderful work by David Denkenberger about ways of getting calories that can, and food that can feed humans even if the sky is totally darkened by soot from an asteroid impact, supervolcano or nuclear winter. Uh, and the main argument is that the, in this room there is actually quite a lot of carbohydrates. I'm standing on them. Cellulose is carbohydrates. It's just that we can't digest it. It's possible to convert that to digestible uh, and, uh, and, uh, nutrients uh, uh, through various means, uh, chemical or biological, and that might actually feed us. It's not going to be particularly fun or tasty, but that's not the <laughs> point. And uh, this is extremely preliminary research that really needs to be developed and actually turned into something that you can implement the day you notice that the sky looks a bit black today. Um, because we want to prepare for that, so we don't have to uh, reinvent the technology when we only have one month of food left. Okay, biological risks from nature uh, are also nothing to sneeze at. Um, so the Black Death is of course infamous, uh, and generally people tend to assume that uh, we need to worry about that. But even the flu is of course something worth noticing. So this is uh, annual flu deaths by month, and you might notice this one going up slightly off the chart. That's the 1918 flu. We're having an anniversary of it this year. And that's of course what happens when you get a slight mutation of a bird flu virus so suddenly it can spread among us humans and it's really deadly. Were that to happen today it would probably be not quite as bad because we have better health care and generally better immune systems but we also have a much better international communication it would spread much further. And um, one can envision scenarios where these things turn really nasty especially thanks to biotechnology. One might argue that natural pandemics at least can't bring a species to extinction, but unfortunately a lot of frogs have found out the hard way that's not, that's not true if uh, you have a vector-borne disease. So the citrid fungus has killed off various amphibians because uh, you know, toads can also act as hosts. So one should then certainly not uh, uh, count on nature not being able to harm us. But again, historically we should expect one or two pandemics per century but we probably should be much more worried about the anthropogenic risks uh, that we're inducing to ourselves. It seems like the natural risk overall produce a relatively small amount of the total existential risk. Now, we are much better at flubbing our agricultural systems, and of course we're having the problem of climate change, which I'm not terribly worried about as a threat in itself. But as a stressor, putting a systemic stress on uh, our other systems, it can be very dangerous because if you suddenly have problems with your food security and now have a military standoff, now things might get much worse. We also have created very fragile global infrastructures and of course we're having wars. Now the thing about wars is that 
they're unlikely in a conventional sense to wipe us out, but of course nuclear war seems eminently able to at least wreck most of our civilization. But also paradoxically, because of the power of nuclear bomb, in 1945 mankind became aware that it could kill itself. Or at least that it was well on its way towards being able to kill itself. Which actually led to a new understanding that the end of humanity might be something we cause, but it's also partially a political decision. Which is actually a really interesting observation. Now, finally, of course, we have emerging technologies which, insofar it's going to be powerful, it's also going to be pretty able to create real havoc. Uh, ranging both from the rather troublesome cyber warfare over to the really scary misuses of uh, CRISPR and other biotechnologies over to the thing we do a lot of study of uh, over at our institute, how to keep powerful artificial intelligence safe and beneficial, um, which is a very non trivial problem. There are stuff that people have been concerned about, like whether uh, particle physics experiments could actually uh, destroy the world. It's an interesting case, as I talked about in earlier talks, uh, here, actually, no, the risk doesn't seem to be very high, but proving it is surprisingly hard. And physicists were surprisingly shocking and complacent about it. We need to become better about that. But uh, to sum up, you can then slice and dice these risks in various ways. So this is my colleague uh, Owen's uh, taxonomy, looking at where does it come from? Is it nature? Is it uh, accidental or deliberate? Is it something we do because we're just bad at coordinating with each other? And then the questions about why can't we stop it? Is it because it's so big and intense like a supernova or because it's something creeping up on us like a disease or uh, something? The, does it conceal itself? And finally, why does it harm us? Is it because it blocks our capacity as an intelligent species? Does it destroy the habitats of things we need? Or does it just get everywhere? Or is it actively seeking us out? I don't have the time to get into that much. But just as a general motivation here for the rest of it, there are very good reasons to be concerned about the existential risk, because they threaten all future value. Of course, they also threaten 7.3 billion people, us, right now. Uh, so we have an interest in uh, not having a disaster in, in, uh, during our lifetime. But we do also don't want a disaster to happen uh, rather far in the future, because that means that there's a lot of future lives that won't happen. Now, some people have uh, philosophies that say that actually doesn't matter. Future lives don't matter very much. But quite a lot of philosophies have various aspects that the future has some form of value. And as I'm going to show, there is going to be quite a lot of potential value up there. Uh, there is an interesting possibility that maybe we're the only conscious beings in the universe. So if we go extinct, there is no consciousness, no value at all in the universe. The universe suddenly turns pointless. I don't really believe uh, that as an argument, but it's an interesting one. And generally, of course, you can even make a fairness argument here, that we shouldn't be discriminating against people in the future, just like we should discriminate the people far from us. So hence, we shouldn't be actually uh, exposing them to a lot of risk. So these are some of the reasons why we think existential risks are super important. Another cool problem here is, of course, fixing them is a bit of a, the ultimate uh, public uh, good problem. Because the future is kind of free riding on us. If we actually uh, reduce risk, they get the benefit and don't have to pay for it. Darn, those bastards. Of course, we might want them, uh, we think it still uh, is a good thing, but it is this problem that when there is a potential for free riding or you can't get rewarded for being virtuous, I'll, uh, people are much worse at it. So these are interesting problems we actually need to work on. So the, one of the reasons I'm working on grand futures is that I want to show just how much is at stake just, uh, and just how much we might want to extend our time horizons. Because quite a lot of lack of effort in fixing these risks is that people say, yeah, but it's so far in the future. We don't need to worry about nuclear waste or climate change or asteroids or uh, CRISPR-Cas modified uh, viruses. Um, that's going to be years in the future. But if you start stretching time horizons, you realize, actually, I might be around years in the future. I might actually have to think about gardening in a world with climate change and uh, deadly viruses. That might not be very fun. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, it looks like we have a chance of actually doing stuff about it, but we need to steer a bit. And we call it around the office macro strategy. It's not just that we want to have as much technology as possible, 
that is causing a lot of these risks. We want to have better coordination. A lot of these problems are because of lack of coordination. But you don't want just coordination. If we all were totally unified, we might still totally flub it because uh, we don't have the tools to do anything useful about it, or, go in, or we are going in the wrong direction because we don't have much insight. Having a lot of insight but no techno uh, coordination technology just means that you know what you should do, but you're impotent. You want a combination. But it might even be that some of these combinations are dangerous. A lot of technology without insight uh, and coordination is obviously dangerous. But it might be that certain combinations of insight and coordination are also risky. If we can just convince each other about some ideology and it happens to be wrong, then we might all be rushing off at a very great speed and force in some random direction, which might cause that we actually do some dangerous things. So we want to figure out some things about the directions here as early as possible. So on the technology side, we have at least some tools. Exploratory engineering is something um, and, and my colleague uh, Eric Drexler has been a pioneer of. He did, used this to think about nanotechnology, but it has longer roots. It goes back to you know, the work of the British Interplanetary Society in the uh, 1930s, when they actually did a very careful model of, could you actually land a man on the moon and bring him safely back again? And uh, in their paper, they outlined essentially a rocket system that uh, could on paper do this. Carefully engineered, it just that we of course couldn't build it because we didn't have a budget. But assuming you built it, it was very likely, given what we know about engineering and well-tested methods, that that would have worked. Uh, that was published in 1939, then the Second World War caused this to close. But right after uh, the war, they of course just updated the model with now with a liquid uh, 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 rocket engine based on the German V2 rockets, and now it looked even more feasible. So here you reason through based on uh, the uh, technologies that we know given uh, the laws of science then, uh, and the uh, practical engineering that could be done. They might not be the best solutions, but they are things that are allowed by the laws of physics, but we don't have it yet. That allows us to put some bounds on the realm of possibilities without being totally arbitrary. Um, so we can also make an interesting analogy that if nature is doing it, quite often we have been able to uh, duplicate it. Sometimes just by taking nature and domesticating it. Sometimes by analyzing what's going on and figuring out uh, a better way, like uh, uh, flying. It turns out that uh, there are, uh, uh, flapping your wings is not a good way of making an airplane. But jet engines are. Nature can't build very good jet engines. And nature also failed mostly at making hot air balloons. But we, given that birds existed, we knew that there was possible to have flying objects. Uh, another important thing is that we can automate stuff. And I'm going to come back to this, why this has a tremendous effect. Um, and of course, if you can automate building the machinery, then a lot of things become, happen, uh, become possible. Because now you must not need to be involved in making that. And of course, once you can automate the building of machinery that builds things, or more machinery, the scale goes up tremendously. As we're going to see, this allows us to essentially act on ridiculously large scales. And of course, that means that the limiting factors become essentially things like time, energy, mass. So if we look at the near term options, and I'm going to rush through this because I haven't written much of it in the book yet. But on the other hand, several other uh, 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 talks around here have dealt with the, uh, these more near term stuff. So I'm pretty happy to jump uh, over them quickly. So right now, it looks like we're get, uh, doing better things about our uh, lifespan. We're figuring out how to extend that. I've given the sort, uh, a lot of talks. I think that must have been the first or second talk I gave here about cognitive enhancement and how to improve that. There are interesting questions on how far you can boost a biological brain, but we can certainly you know, use the ones we have in better ways. Another interesting thing, and this goes straight back to that exploratory engineering, is uh, essentially what are our material limits. So even if we say, yeah, we're going to run out of non-renewable stuff, there is actually quite a lot of energy. So if you look at the energy use per capita of the world and the total amount, uh, then it turns out that that corresponds to about uh, uh, 26 square meter of solar panels per person. You might need to double it because of uh, the, the night occur occurring uh, half of the time. But if you have a really good power grid, of course, you could make do with less. The point is, 
26 square meters. That's, well, about this uh, stage, I guess. So, um, so that's my uh, uh, solar panel. You wouldn't need to pave the entire Earth to have that much. Um, you can think about roofing. And this is a pretty silly way of doing it. There are probably better ways of doing renewable energy. Uh, similarly, in the long run, uh, it seems very plausible that we could reach at atomically precise manufacturing, uh, nanotechnology. And that has an interesting consequence because that means recycling becomes essentially just energy and entropy limited. You need energy enough to break up molecular bond in your garbage, and then you need energy and precision to put them back into the right order. That's going to produce waste heat that you need to get rid of. In fact, the waste heat is probably the, a bigger problem than the energy. Uh, it uh, has been suggested that you can have uh, only about 10 kilograms of active nanomachines per person on the planet, because beyond that point, it starts heating up, because we're doing so much metabolic activity. So there are certainly environmental limitations even here, but uh, it seems like the normal scarcity limitations uh, actually disappear. Uh, I haven't had the time to get into the agriculture part, but the interesting thing here is, of course, that automation allows you to do much more. Um, I don't know how many of you are fam familiar with this kind of economic gro uh, growth model, the Cobbs-Douglas equations in economics. Mm -hmm. Typically, we consist of multiplying together something that hand-wavingly is called technology with a factor corresponding to labor and a factor corresponding to capital. And then you kind of imagine capital buying a factory and the people working in that one and producing stuff that's worth something. The interesting thing here is, of course, that if you can automate something, you can ignore the labor part. Because now you have robots. Now you have some uh, machines that do it for you. That means that it's just technology and capital. This might, of course, have some interesting consequences on our economy. But again, I'm not going to get into the questions about technological unemployment and what we do with our lives, etc. I'm just observing that the productivity here can go in very high. Especially when you start thinking about robots building more factories, etc. So one of the interesting and slightly scary things is, of course, that you can, might be able to convert capital almost straight into labor. If I need more uh, robots, I just buy them. If I need more artificial intelligence and, uh, to solve problems for me, I just rent more cloud time. Which means that if I happen to own this, I can uh, multiply my capital quite a lot, which might lead to very dramatic inequalities. It might, of course, also with the right kind of redistribution economy lead to totally different things. Well, luxury gay and uh, space communism is one possibility. I don't know about uh, the communism uh, part here, but I'm, in fo I'm really f in favor of that uh, automated luxury gay and space. So, um, yeah. We'll see where we end up here. The main point is, even very, very standard economics, when you, if you take automation and artificial intelligence seriously, they blow up. Uh, the technological singularity is quite often expressed as something that uh, only wild-eyed futurists are dealing with. But economists, they have a hard time avoiding it when you do endogenous growth models or just use these ones. You need to uh, work rather hard to demonstrate why the friction and delays in the system prevent you from having a mag massively growing economy. It's actually an interesting unsolved problem why the economy is just growing exponentially. Mathematically, it's weird. Either it should stagnate or it should have a singularity. Just having an exponential, that's odd. Now, superintelligence is another one of those things that I'm just going to scurry over. Obviously, if you want to think carefully about it, read Nick's book. Um, and um, the main point here is rather that uh, what I'm describing here is a post-scarcity situation. And normally when we talk about post-scarcity, we start thinking about uh, things like uh, the land of cocaine, where uh, uh, the walls are made out of sausage and uh, fried sparrows fly into your mouth so you can eat them. You have a lot of food or a lot of gold or palaces and other luxury items. Um, but actually what it's about is that you have ma uh, enough matter and energy to organize it into forms that makes your life work well. Whatever that is and uh, whether that will make people happy is another matter. But there is also a lack of intelligence, lack of problem solving capacity. Where would you actually get artificial general intelligence? That essentially becomes something you can get on tap too. So beyond the point where you have this, you are probably going to find a civilization that's going to, at least by terrestrial standards, be ridiculously well off. And then, of course, we might also turn weirdly post-human, but I don't have the time for that. 
But let's retreat a bit back from the weird post-human stuff and just think about farming. And uh, uh, how many people could sustainably live on Earth? This is a classic question. Uh, Leeuwenhoek, the guy who invented the microscope, uh, he actually did a calculation back in the 1600s and reached, I think, uh, an estimate of about 11 billion people based on the productivity of the Dutch countryside, which is not a uh, too bad uh, guesstimate. Uh, these days, the guesstimates are they're, they're all over the place. So on one hand, you have uh, people arguing that, no, Earth can't survive really well unless you have about 100 million hunter-gatherers. Beyond that, it's going to start messing up the ecosystem. Uh, if you look at Ehrlich, who's a bit of a doomster about the environment, but he thinks we can have agriculture, he thinks maybe 1.75 billion. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think we have pretty good uh, reasons to, uh, to believe that 10 billion could sustainably uh, live on Earth. And if you actually really say, yeah, let's ignore the natural biosphere, let's just produce food for people, uh, then I reach about uh, seven, uh, 7 trillion people. That's going to be a bit like James Blish's novel, A Torrent of Faces, where everybody is living in giant arcology, each arcology with a billion inhabitants, and between them you have just high yield fields of um, plants, and the oceans are all algal farms. Uh, yeah, not exactly maybe the future we want to go for, but a lot of people. If you really value people and human lives, this is of course where we might want to push. If you really think that the environment uh, should be sustainable, you might want to push in a different direction. But here is an interesting metaphor. If we imagine each human life, the entire life, as a very fine speck of uh, dust, a bit like the less soil you get uh, in East Asia, then it turns out that the, the current 7.3 billion people would just barely fit in my hands like this. The entire continents would be pouring through my fingers. And all past people would fit into a pretty heavy rucksack for, that I could carry. The Roman Empire might be in a side pocket. So if we now start thinking about the, the, those numbers and how long we could last on Earth, we know that mammalian species typically survive about uh, a million years. So if we naturally survive for 800,000 years more uh, and uh, we had hunter-gatherers, that means that we would expect to get 800 billion people in the future. Now, if we multiply that uh, with kind of sustainable farmers, we get 14 trillion people in the future. If we start thinking about how long we could survive on uh, Earth because the biosphere is still around, it looks like the biosphere is probably going to be running for at least a billion years. It's uh, give or take about 500 million years in either direction. And this is assuming we're not artificially extending it. At that point, we get uh, 10 to the 15. And of course, if we go for this really extreme thing, we just want to have as many people in the future as we can possibly cram onto Earth, we end up with uh, 10 to the 19. And now it turns out that I think the mid scenario here corresponds to, in my dust example, to about the mass of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Imagine that as dust, every dust grain a human life somewhere in the future. That's a lot compared to this handful of dust we currently are. That's a lot of human life. So even if I stop the talk right here and say this is the most we can expect, that handful of dust versus the Great Pyramid already shows that the future has an enormous weight. Even if we count every future life a hundredth as much as our own lives, because after all, what have they done for us? That's just a hundredth of that pyramid, still much bigger than my handful of dust. The future gains tremendous size and value. Of course, we might argue about you know, these lives, whether they're happy lives and what's going on there. I'm not saying anything about that. Uh, if maybe if they're all depraved, uh, we might really wish they don't exist. But given the assumption that you, they are like us, neither better nor worse, that is a tremendous amount of value. And of course, we don't have to stay on this planet. We already have demonstrated, at least in principle, that humans can live at least briefly off Earth. Uh, we can put stuff on other planets. We're not great at it yet, but it doesn't seem to be any particular fundamental reason why we can't get better at it. Uh, so while Biosphere 2 got most of the press um, about um, making artificial biospheres because it was big, fancy, and in a, in a very visible place, these closed environments uh, are much more boring and uh, much less tasty, but they're also much more stable. It looks very likely that we could actually within 
a few, in a few years, if we really put our mind to it, put stuff like this up in space. Similarly, we can, at great, great cost, put space stations up. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to go to space instantly. Because uh, probably it's going to take somebody like Elon Musk that has a lot of uh, money and the price is coming down enough for it to actually be feasible. If you need to be a mayor and a superpower to uh, put stuff in space, it's not going to happen. But typically the prices seem to be coming down exponentially, which means that eventually it's going to be minor superpowers and then normal powers and the bigger companies and rich people and then well-off people. It would be rather weird if it uh, didn't end up that somebody would start going to space. And again, surviving in space is another matter. So we have a very big uh, threshold to get over. But it's in pretty implausible that we can't do this in a thousand years of time if we actually wanted to, or if some people wanted to. It will, will not happen if we totally lose our uh, civilization, if we become hunter-gatherers, or whether we manage to create a self-sustaining dictatorship that keeps everybody uh, eating gruel all the day or whatever. But um, overall, it seems pretty likely that we can do it, and it's also very likely that it will eventually be done. Now, what are the limits of living in space? You might recognize these pictures from the 70s, uh, Gerald O'Neill's wishes of making uh, rotating self-sufficient habitats. The interesting thing about them is that they circumvent this traditional idea that, oh, you need to live on a planet. Um, and to some extent, uh, Elon Musk's interest in colonizing Mars is uh, it's kind of retro, actually. It's almost like uh, fins on cars from the 50s style uh, space in many ways. Um, yeah, planets have a lot of advantages, but they're also heavy. It's hard to get onto them and get off them. And um, if you can actually build these structures, which is going to take a lot of infrastructure up in space, you can actually design things. They're also rather fragile, so you do want to keep peace with your neighbors. That's one of the advantages with planets. It's hard for your neighbor to lob a rock on you, although you have a much more predictable orbit than these ones. The interesting thing is when you start looking at the resources even in the solar system, it's kind of ridiculous numbers. Um, so the environment is not very good for us because we want to have air pressure, no radi radiation, and uh, water, and so on. But even if you just use those resources to create uh, some of these habitats, it turns out that the total top of the Earth, which is essentially what we have been dealing with previously, that's 10 to the 12 uh, uh, kilogram, a lot. The asteroid belt is uh, 10 to the 21 kilogram. And that's just the asteroid belt. We're even leaving out the planets, which are much heavier. Um, and indeed, it looks like you could actually use this to build a ridiculous amount of habitats. There might be interesting issues here about what's the limiting factor, and I think nitrogen might turn out to be a big problem. It's hard to get a lot of nitrogen in the inner solar system, and we need that for plants and for breathing. But when you start putting this together, the numbers pile up. Also, of course, as I said, automate the, the production. If you uh, get the energy and use that to mine stuff and then uh, get it into orbit and then make more solar collectors, that gives you energy. Guess what happened if the small planet? Whoops. Well, Mercury in, in, is in trouble. Uh, so I've been working a little bit on how easy is it to, to pick up our planets rather than asteroids. And the answer is, yeah, if you put your mind to it, we can do it. The laws of physics seem to totally allow disassembling planets. It takes about 40 years for Mercury. We don't really know how to do it for Jupiter, but that would probably take centuries. But we probably don't need to mess with planets, actually. It seems that uh, asteroids, which also people don't care about quite as much as planets, I think, um, are way easier to disassemble. People will not complain so much about it, and the environmental impact statement is going to be better. Now, the, logi <coughs> the logical end point of this is the Dyson sphere. And um, I could give an entire talk just about Dyson spheres. I spent Christmas calculating stuff. It's so fun. <coughs> So Freeman Dyson argued uh, <coughs> back in, uh, in the 60s that we should look for stars that have been englobed by advanced civilizations. And his argument was something like this. Uh, advanced civilizations need a lot of energy. Eventually, uh, you're going to need as much energy as a star. So the obvious thing is put solar collectors around the star. He didn't envision a solid shell, but rather a swarm. You have a lot of uh, free-flying solar collectors. Uh, a lot of science fiction is assuming a solid shell, but it has various me uh, mechanical uh, problems that make it really implausible. 
You can also make a very thin bubble. If you use very thin uh, metallic foil, uh, it can be kept aloft by the uh, solar radiation pressure versus the gravity. So then you actually need the mass of a, one big asteroid like Vesta, and you can englobe the entire sun. Use that as mirrors to concentrate sunlight uh, on thermal couplers, and now you can get a sizable fraction of the sun's total output. 10 to the 26 watts. It's a ridiculous amount uh, of energy. The best thing to compare it to is, of course, the sun. Uh, it's also where you build habitats, like O'Neill habitats. Now we're talking about a living area measured in square astronomic units. It's, in, it's inconceivable by our normal uh, standards. And were you to use this mass of in the solar system to construct computers and use this to power them, given certain assumptions, you end up something like 10 to the 46 bits uh, of the information storage. And uh, all of this uh, can process 10 to the 49 operations. Except, for, of course, the uh, communication delays between different corners of your shell around the star are going to be fairly long. So there is a lot of interest in computer science problems here. But basically, you can cram an enormous amount of computation in there. Also, if you put sensors on the surface here, uh, you can uh, generally, the power of a telescope depends on how wide it is. Uh, the wider the uh, telescope is, the, the sharper it is which means that this can actually find, uh, see one uh, meter objects at several light years distance. Uh, it, it can also <coughs> detect the light uh, over really large distance. So conversely, uh, you can put antennas and use this uh, to send signals. And now you have uh, something that can communicate essentially to other Dyson shells across the visible universe. In fact, the expansion of the universe is the main limiter uh, on how, mu how much information you can send over. Um, you can also, more sinistly, focus an awful lot of energy on something you don't like over light years of distance. Fortunately, there is actually a theorem in energy transmission that makes this slightly less effective than some of the other applications, which made me very happy. Uh, but yeah, the, the, there is a tre tremendous amount of power here. And the important part here is that this is something we can build. We actually have started, which might sound rather outrageous, but there are these uh, solar observation satellites orbiting the sun. They were material mined from Earth, and then we put it into space, and they have some solar panels that are powering some computation and communication. They're a very, 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 very wimpy first start, that little dot of our Dyson shell. It might take a long time, let's say a million years before we decide to actually do it. But it looks like if you use self-replicating mining, it can be done in decades. So I have this feeling that it's not going to take millions of years before we actually do it, because a Dyson shell can be very impractical. Obviously, there's also going to be a, a lot of interesting questions here about coordination. For example, uh, if Earth is orbiting outside, you better make sure all these solar collectors angle themselves so we get sunlight on Earth. I think it's pretty likely that we might want to preserve Earth as a nature preserve, and for historical reasons. But again, there are interesting issues here about coordination, but many of the practical, technical ones actually seems to be very possible to, with quite high degree of rigor to analyze and so on. One thing I would like to get back to is that we can even use it to move stars, which sounds even more preposterous. So the interesting thing is uh, that I think uh, once we become a, a spacefaring civilization, it seems like a lot of existential risks I mentioned earlier go, uh, go and, uh, and disappear. You get a widely dispersed population, which means that most natural disasters, especially the Earth-bound ones, obviously, are local. And uh, even when you try to attack somebody in space, they can move away. It's actually rather hard to fight in space, which is great. Uh, you're very fragile in space, but space is big, so you're uh, hard to hit. Um, I think the real problem here is, at this point, you really need to start working on co the coordination part, not just making sure that the pieces of your Dyson shell don't collide or people are not fighting wars uh, over how to distribute the energy of the solar system, but there are going to be advanced technologies of other kind that could be dangerous. So there are a lot of interesting issues here about what is needed to get to this stage, and they are more on the kind of philosophical, political side than the technical one. So now look at the mid-range options because this was the short term. Basically, uh, in the, uh, we have been discussing uh, doing stuff first on Earth and then in the solar system, but we got billions of planets in the Milky Way. 
maybe about 30 billion. That is uh, give or take, we don't really know. It might be moving up or down by an, an order of magnitude or more. So if we went out and uh, settled them, and then uh, you would end up uh, with 10 to the 29 lives. So in my dust analogy, that corresponds to the mass of the uh, rings of Saturn. Analogies are supposed to make something intuitive, natural, and none of us have any intuition whatsoever for how heavy the rings of Saturn are. So it's kind of totally failed its job as a metaphor. I'm sorry, but it's still a nice picture. <laughs> now, another interesting observation is we can actually send the things to the stars using 1970s technology. Voyager is getting to the stars very slowly, and we haven't aimed it at any particular star, uh, but we can do it. It's just that it's not going to function when it gets there. Uh, but it's still probably going to be a recognizable artifact for a very, very long time. The question is, can you make interstellar craft that actually uh, work? And uh, here is another uh, classic from the British Interplanetary Society, the Daedalus uh, probe. So this was a rather detailed study on, assuming we have a fusion reactor, what would go into something to travel to Barnard Star? The big problem here is that the rocket equation is really, really evil and bad. It's my least favorite equation in physics because it basically tells you you need an exponential amount of uh, reaction mass and fuel to accelerate something to a high speed. And then, of course, if you want to slow down at the destination, you need another exponential. This is very bad. This is why rockets are very big and why it's expensive to get into space, besides that gravity thing. Now, one very neat way of getting around this is, of course, external launching. Uh, you actually use a laser to no, no, get a solar sail, or in this case, a light sail, uh, to accelerate. So the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative, they are aiming at actually, in the next two or three decades, actually launch light sails carrying very small ship-like uh, uh, probes uh, towards other stars at 20% of light speed. This works because they're very light and you use a lot of very powerful lasers. It's still an ongoing engineering project, but it doesn't look like it's uh, uh, impossible according to the laws of physics. It's just a lot of interesting engineering and some politics because you also want to convince the nations of the world that that giant laser array you set up is not an anti-satellite weapon. <laughs> Although it could work as that one too. So designing it so it can't be used as an anti-satellite weapon is going to be a major challenge. Many of these technologies, the basic technology is not the challenge, it's the design around it. Building the iPhone, uh, the technology itself wasn't that different from anything else. It was putting together pieces in a way that actually makes it work. Now, the interesting thing here is that these kind of systems can be used even to slow things uh, because you could have a uh, project a laser over long distances and use a sail to reflect it back to slow down the little chip. It's going to take a much bigger system than uh, the Starshot are thinking about. But this is kind of a first sketch. And uh, if they build this, as a side effect, you can, of course, send these ships to everybody we know of in the solar system very, very cheaply. A lot of space because very cheap. I don't have the time to get into questions about the payload, but it doesn't seem to that it has to be very power big in order to actually build something that could build an infrastructure at the destination. And then you can uh, do a lot of cool calculations, which uh, I think I mentioned before. I did a paper with Stuart Armstrong about it. But basically, we found out that uh, you can send stuff over very long distances uh, using uh, a lot of energy, which is easy if you have a Dyson shell. There are some speed limits. And perhaps the, uh, so if you have a limited amount of energy, obviously you can't, so this is velocity, and this would correspond to light speed. Obviously you can't get everything up to light speed because that takes an infinite amount of energy. So if you have a limited amount of energy, you have some upper limit. Uh, but the important limit might actually, this is the mass of a probe. So if you send something very big, it can just plow through the space and hit various things. And, uh, and that works really well, but now you have a lot of uh, energy, uh, energy requirements. The real problem turns out to be dust, this purple line. Uh, in space, there is dust, and if you're moving at near light speed, if you hit a dust grain, that's an explosion that can be nuclear in power. So it turns out that probably the realistic thing is that we want to aim at this corner. Rather small probes, but they're big enough to withstand dust, and that also puts in the speed limit. Uh, 
Uh, again, I don't have the time to get into it, but let's, uh, we can take it for questions because there's so much cool stuff going on here. There are even questions like heating because the ga hydrogen gas in space, if you're moving through it, it fast enough, it's going to act as a proton beam, which is not going to be terribly good for a rocket unless you design it to use that, for example, as an energy source. Although it will, of course, slow you down. So for the really, really extreme uh, speeds, you even get slowed down by these collisions and even the cosmic microwave ra background radiation that get blue shifted as if it was somebody was shining a laser at you from the front. But anyway, uh, given these assumptions about self-replicating technologies, basically you can expand over very large areas. The problem is actually the universe is also expanding. And it's expanding faster and faster, which means that there's some places that you can't reach because they will run away from you faster than you can ever get to them. So if you solve the Friedman equations and calculate it, you can basically calculate how much you can go to at different speeds. And at 50% of light speed, we can read the 130 million galaxies. That's already pretty inconceivable. We have a hard time imagining one galaxy, and we're living in one. At 90% uh, of uh, light speed, you can get to 1.8 billion galaxies. And at 99% of light speed, you can reach 4.8 billion uh, galaxies. Again, this is an inconceivable number. It's slightly less than 7.3 billion galaxies, which would mean that everybody could, in theory, uh, inherit one galaxy. But I think we can share. I think this is a big enough. This is the limit set by the expansion of the universe. Of course, we might actually think that actually we don't care uh, to colonize that much. Obviously, we can go slower and colonize smaller things or care about different things. But, but this is a sketch of a visible universe. And this is what we could reach at light speed. This is uh, at 99%, 80%, and 50%. Uh, I've been trying to update this diagram by putting some maps of galaxy clusters or superclusters or Lana Ikea, if you know about it, but they don't show up. They're kind of a pixel at the center. This is ridiculously vast. So if we wanted to colonize uh, the reachable universe, and we just settled on planets, no fancy Dyson cells or, no, or anything like that, then it would mean something on the order of 10 to the 38 lives. So in my dust analogy, that corresponds to the mass of the sun, compar the sun's size compared to my current handful. And of course, we could build Dyson sh shells and have O'Neill colonies, and now we're talking 10 to the 47 uh, lives, which in my dust analogy correspond to the mass of the central black hole in the Milky Way. Again, it's a totally hopeless metaphor. It's just broken. Uh, but again, I lo love the fact that we even have a map of a star orbit near it, so I used it. What can we do with these resources? We can, of course, live in them, but there are various kinds of material. Planets are a millionth uh, of uh, everything there is. If you count the darn dust, well, that 2.5 millionth, and then you have some black holes, and you have stars, and uh, things like that. But this is still a tiny, tiny part, of course, because most of the mass in the universe is just hydrogen between the galaxies, not doing anything in particular. Dark matter, which is just sitting there being dark and mysterious at the time being. And of course, dark energy, which seems to be even worse. It just, <laughs> just accelerates things. It's a lovely diagram. It's based on a really name, uh, an uh, amazing paper by uh, Fukujita and Peebles, the cosmic energy inventor, where we actually try to make a list of what are the contents of the universe and how certain are we about them. So depending on what advanced civilization can use, different amounts of the universe is usable. And it seems to me that what we're looking at here is potentially a kind of phase transition of matter. So we are aware matter. We are combinations of atoms and energy that move around to talk and uh, know that we're moving around talking and making plans for the future, debating whether these are the right parameters even to use for conversation. And we and our life are good at converting non-life into life. Where some of these ex technological expansive scenarios I've been sketching to come true, that means that a fraction of matter in the universe gets reorganized into this kind of thinking and, and, and changing matter. It's a very interesting thing because it's actually a real phase transition. It's a change in organization. And uh, this can actually extend to ridiculously large scales. The largest size scales we see in cosmology are on the order of hundreds of uh, megaparsec. That's essentially the large scale structure of the voids and clusters in the universe. 
But if we expand over gigaparsec and then for some weird religious reason decides to make uh, uh, put galaxies in a checkerboard pattern or something like that, we would have created a structure far bigger than what normal cosmology would enable. And this is just because intelligent minds decided on something. Of course, they need to decide earlier too. Because if we try to decide this late, once we expanded over billions of light years, we can't tell each other because the galaxies are moving away from each other. So the long-term options, and now I think I'm running out of time, but I'm just briefly going to run through the, the rest of the universe. <coughs> Basically, we're, over the next 100 uh, trillion years, we're still going to have stars. Uh, yellow stars like our sun are actually becoming rarer already. We're going to reach, reach peak star in about uh, 20 uh, billion years. And then it's going to be slowly, slowly downhill, but it's the red dwarf stars that are going to last for trillions and trillions of years. And they might actually be nice to live around. We just don't know yet. Um, what is then going to happen once the stars turn out is the so-called degenerate era. Not because it's very immoral, but simply uh, that we, the, the objects that exist are in the kind of white dwarfs and, and neutron stars, which are degenerate matter and some brown dwarfs, and then there's a few black holes. And uh, after that era, once that matter is gone, you essentially just have a black holes. And after that, you probably don't have much at all except free floating particles. And at that point, uh, things get really weird. So the, the Celiferous era, the kind of big events that is happening right now is we're getting stars to form. They're converting hydrogen into interesting heavier elements. Some of these heavier elements are intelligent and think and try to do stuff. Um, what is also happening is that the universe accelerates in expansion. And in about 100 billion years, uh, we are going to lose contact with the other galaxy clusters. So if we actually think it's worthwhile to colonize over those distances, we need to get there before that point. If we wait until uh, then and then try, we will never catch up. So this gets to the value question. What is the value of colonizing such a big space? If you want to just spam the universe with your uh, national flag or happy minds, then you should go uh, spread it very widely. If you think that, hmm, we want to collect uh, a great civilization, I think deep thoughts together, then you want to stay in one galactic supercluster that stays together, or even maybe bring a few a extra ones in so you have extra company. Beyond this point uh, in the Stelliferous era, things quieten down a fair bit as the stars get older and older. Uh, what happens in the degenerate era it is to a large degree that very uh, slowly the various brown dwarfs are occasionally going to collide and turn into red dwarf stars. On average, there's going to be five red dwarf stars in the Milky Way at any point in time because of this very, very slow and rare process. But they last for trillions of years. But it's also going to be a bit of other weird, unconventional star formation. So this looks, from our perspective, as a rather inhospitable world. But maybe that is just because we're used to this extremely hot 300 Kelvin environment that we're living in. It might be possible that actually this is a perfect environment and, uh, to do computation in. I'm going to briefly get back to that. Because I do think this might be where most of the thinking, feeling, and culture, and, and love in the universe might be occurring. The problem is that in about 10 to the 20 year, the galaxies dissolve. Basically, stars get close, and pass close to each other occasionally. Occasionally, one gets escape velocity and fl flies out into intergalactic space, never to be heard from again. The other one gets in a lower orbit. Gradually, the galaxies evaporate or fall into the central black hole. This is rather boring, and we might want to do something about that. Um, eventually, in somewhere around 10 to the 32, 10 to the 36-ish years, we don't know. Particle physicists rather firmly believe proton decay will happen. It's just that all the experiments to detect it have so far failed, so we know it's very, very slow. That might be the ultimate deadline for our kind of uh, intelligence, because we're dependent on protons and other baryons to actually do our thinking. We don't know a good way of actually having something, information processing or alive without protons. So that might be the final curtains uh, for intelligence in the universe, unless it turns out that particle physicists are wrong about this, or there are a way around it somehow. Uh, I am tinkering with some cool ways around it using neutrino stars and Wigner crystals, but maybe that's for the pub. Anyway. Beyond that point, in 10 to the 60 years, you have a black hole era. Essentially, the universe consists of black holes sitting there. Because of gravitational radiation, they have all merged together. Each black hole is just sitting there in an essentially empty universe. 
This looks like it's tre tremendously boring from our perspective. Slow Hawking radiation means that they turn into particles that then uh, evaporate away. And finally, you reach uh, the particle era, sometimes called the dark era or the acausal era, because now you have essentially isolated elementary particles in a universe where there is nothing you can, uh, can communicate, because there is no other particle to communicate to. There is nothing to store information in except your one particle. There are no observers, there is no way of measuring time. So this is an illustration of Robert Flood's uh, book on alchemy and cosmology, Utryuski Cosmi, where he has this illustration of how the universe looked before it was created. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a big black square. And around the, the border it says, et sic in infinitum, and so on, forever. <laughs> he couldn't fit in more black on the page. <laughs> yeah. And that's probably a pretty good description of this era. Now, it might be that a lot of weird things happen, because there are various, very unlikely random processes that might actually mean that stuff still happens over here. There might be vacuum decay. There might be Boltzmann brains popping into existence for no good reason, thinking various things and upsetting philosophers and physicists. There might even be the creation of new universes. Again, I don't have the time to get into it, but it doesn't look like we can affect it in any way, so it's kind of annoying. So from our perspective, is we have a deadline kind of personal deadline that in about a billion years the biosphere uh, starts turning bad. In uh, about 100 billion years, at that point, the galaxy the clusters run away. And we have a proton decay problem in 10 to the 34 years or something like that. Give or take something. Some of the later ones are a bit uncertain, especially the really weird ones about Boltzmann brains. Um, so what do we do about this? Well, we need to think about what we want to do. And I don't have the time to get into the computational aspect, but basically my argument is that whatever is actually valuable in the world, computation is necessary for it. Falling in love might not, the core part of falling in love is not maybe the computation. But if you can't store the information about who you're in love with, and remember that you've fallen in love, and etc., there doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to work. There seems to be in a, in something about contents being necessary for having love or consciousness or qualia. They might in themselves, of course, maybe float around without any information, but information processing is necessary to bind it together. So if something prevents information processing, we can be pretty certain that there's not going to be much love or consciousness going on either. So we can at least, and since we know a bit about the physics of information processing, we can kind of trace those limits. Again, I'm totally running out of time, I'm just briefly mentioning that uh, how much you can do depends on temperature. Uh, we can right now use supermassive black holes to cool things down, but in the long run it's set by cosmology. And there is this weird ultimate temperature set by the accelerating expansion of the universe. And please, please don't ask me why, because I don't understand that part. But that allows us actually to calculate the value and so on. And basically, uh, yet, uh, it might be smart even for advanced civilization to estimate until these very late, very cold eras. And what happens is, well, basically, you don't want to lose some of the matter because uh, some stars are burning it, some of it's falling into black holes. A lot of it seems to be falling out of galaxies. So we, you might want to actually prevent uh, losses of matter over a really long time. I had a very fun time uh, this winter calculating how to use Dysoshell to move stars and galaxies around. And it turns out that the turning radius of the Milky Way is not great, but you can turn it. We still can't avoid colliding with Andromeda, though. But basically, we can show that physics allows us to uh, manipulate the matter content on ridiculously large scales. And that leads to this interesting uh, thing that basically, we can calculate how much more stuff, how many more events that leave lasting impact actually happen in, over the future of the universe. And it's this conveniently small number, 10 to uh, 121. No, I can't envision what that actually means. Uh, in my dust analogy, basically what happens is that uh, if we imagine this counted up in terms of uh, human lives, we get more mass than it exists in the visible universe. My metaphor has not just blown up, it's larger than what we're trying to talk about. So, what does this mean for us? Now I've taken you on a tour here to the very, very ridiculously far future. And, uh, and uh, show you some ridiculously large but finite numbers. It's worth noticing that uh, right now my model doesn't seem to allow us infinite computation. It doesn't look like it's giving us infinity. There must be, uh, getting there requires other means than I have been able to find. 
But still, it looks like the future could be tremendously valuable. And that puts us at a very uh, sensitive point, because we can flub it right now. We, we can basically crash uh, the entire, this entire future if Donald Trump presses the wrong button, a very big button on his desk. <laughs> we might want to do something about that. Uh, delaying cosmological uh, expansion and going to space is actually fairly okay because it's very sensitive to uh, speed. So if we actually spend a million years getting our act together in the local neighborhood and then go fast across the universe, we actually don't lose that many galaxies because uh, we can go faster later on. But it also seems that we have this interesting situation. Right now, everybody on this planet is one seventh of a second away from uh, everybody else. That's the time it takes for light to go around the planet. We are all, in principle, in a global village. About half of us still aren't online, but uh, that is going to change. We might want to speed it up and do it in a good way. And we might also want to think about what we want to do long term. Because once you start spreading out over these enormous vast distances, you can't take things back. If there is something very bad you might be doing, you might want to ban that beforehand and get everybody to agree on, let's keep this ban forever. If there is something we need to coordinate, you might want to set that up before because it might be very hard to coordinate. For example, moving together galaxies to form a hypercluster to last much longer requires rather careful arrangement to make it symmetric, otherwise it collapses in exciting ways. And you don't want exciting uh, supercluster collapses around you. So you want to agree on that. So there's this idea that's been floating around in our community in Oxford about the long reflection. But we might actually want to have a time of thinking, OK, we have now solved mo many of our core problems. We still haven't solved all of them, but we need to kind of think about our uh, the fundamental values. Because once we really start spreading, there's no going back. And we actually have a fantastic opportunity right now. And I think we're at the start of a long reflection. I hope this, this talk has given you a reason to think that it might be worthwhile to think about these very far futures. What actually makes sense to aim for the universe to become? Thank you. So it wasn't 10 to the 10, but 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 10. Anders, yeah. do these numbers matter? And there's a famous uh, moral philosopher, Joseph Stalin, who said that the death of one person is a tragedy, the death of a million is a statistic. We don't tend to care about these large numbers. So if, you want, want, if we want to motivate people to care more about the present day, it doesn't make any difference to t whether the future is 10 to the power of 10 or 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 10. Is there yeah. any evidence that these pictures and numbers uh, can change people's motivation here or now? Uh, it's interesting to note, actually, Stalin's quote means that he actually de described scope neglect before the psychologists who coined the term did it by several decades. Uh, and it's true. Uh, we get numbed by big numbers. Uh, and in many regards, I'm a bit concerned that my talk might have the opposite effect. Because obviously, how can we tell apart 10 to the 20 and 10 to the 36? What's the difference? The difference is, of course, enormous, but even the, the scope of the enormity is hard. In many ways, I think this is a really interesting intellectual challenge, how to think about very big things. I wanted to make a talk that was as true as I can make it. I want to try to have rigorous reasons why I actually reach these numbers, and not just making them up by uh, guessing. But getting back to our own problems, I think understanding that the future is vast, that is the important part. So if there is anything you uh, should remember is that, well, if a current humanity is uh, 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 this handful of dust, the future is at least the Pyramid of Giza or some other suitable mountain. Uh, I think that is something we can think about. The, the, the rings of Saturn, etc. that's more amusement uh, because it's interesting for me. Has your research led you to change your views on how likely we are to be alone in the universe? When your reflections on the Permi paradox, for example, have you any new insight from that? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, so I have this uh, general uh, view that 
either we are living in the zoo, there are advanced aliens that have been able to reach us, because one of the side effects of Stuart's and my calculation about how the ability to spread over intergalactic distances is that we need to be concerned not just about aliens from the Milky Way, but from other galaxies. And if they started early, they could have spread over even bigger distances than we could ever reach. We're relative latecomers, so we have a much smaller possible uh, space. But it still seems that the universe is not taken over by intelligence. A lot of the things I was describing here, moving stars, etc., are pretty visible. They should be in, uh, showing up in, uh, as glaringly obvious phenomena uh, in the telescopes of astronomers, and we're not seeing that. So that means that either I'm very wrong uh, uh, about this being possible, or perhaps more interesting, that maybe advanced civilization don't want to do that for some uh, particular reasons, or that we're alone. So I've been working a bit on the uncertainties about the Fermi paradox. And my own estimation is that now I'm starting to believe that we're probably alone in the visible universe. That doesn't mean we're alone in the universe. Uh, the universe is much, much bigger than what we can see. It's just that our nearest neighbors, we might never, ever get to meet them, which is a bit sad. But maybe we can create our own aliens using artificial intelligence or by just evolving into very different species. But generally, I think we are in a fairly sparsely populated universe. And one last question for me before I open to the floor. And by the way, there are one or two seats at the front. So if you, those of you are sitting at the sides or on the, on the stairs, if you want to come and uh, climb over the bench in the front or shuffle along, you, you maybe find somewhere else to sit. So don't, don't be shy. You can come and uh, move around. And as my question is about your evaluation of existential risks, the argument you've given might make it more important for us to do something about the existential risks. But have you changed your mind as to which ones deserve a priority? I, mean, I remember hearing you a few years ago saying that there's about five that's high up on the list of the Ox uh, at the Martin School in Oxford. Is that the same list of five today as in the past? They, they're kind of bumping up and down a little bit. So my top one is still top one, and that's nuclear war. Uh, I had the uh, somewhat mixed feeling that I discovered a paper I was writing about the probability of nuclear war. I found that some of the re uh, it actually reduced my estimation of the risk, which is kind of good news. But unfortunately, we've got Trump, which is kind of objectively increasing it. But it's still on the top. Uh, then we have biotech risk, which I think is still small and it's sidling up. Uh, I had the fortune of being par uh, part of uh, the United Nations Bioweapons Convention meeting uh, last December. And on one hand, it's reassuring to see that people are trying to fix things. It's also rather depressing to see how bad we are at coordinating fixing these things. So that one is making me a bit more worried. Artificial intelligence, yeah, it's a scary p possibility. It's fa relatively far in the future. But I think the AI safety community is actually getting somewhere. They're actually discovering useful stuff, so I'm getting happier about that. I think unknown unknowns still should be uh, taken seriously. Uh, I think uh, climate as a systemic risk is an interesting one. I've started to work a project now on how we keep our civilization system uh, resilient. And I think that is really important. Even if it doesn't kill us, a uh, civilization collapse is really awkward. And it makes us much more vulnerable for all the other bad stuff. And how can we guard against unknown unknowns, that fourth on your list? Uh, a very interesting idea came from Frank Miller, <coughs> who participated in a, a program I ran on existential risk. He pointed out that if you see the ruins of a lot of alien civilizations, we know that there is something dangerous out there, but we don't know what it is. We also know that the, those aliens probably saw the ruins of alien civilization, so they tried to do something, and whatever they did, we shouldn't be doing it. So that might suggest that if you actually have evidence that there's a lot of danger out there, you should do something very, very unlikely and weird. This sounds like a total Hail Mary, but it's actually an interesting game theoretical idea. And given that people haven't been thinking very much about how to handle unknown unknowns, I think there are probably a lot of other low-hanging fruits here. So there might be tools we can do for that. Questions from the floor? Hi, Anders. Uh, just one thing, all your calculations out there as to how far we can get in the, in the universe are all assuming that we're going to be able to travel faster than light. Have you got any uh, ideas on whether that will eventually be possible, such as like Al Alcubierre's drive and mm -hmm. so forth? Uh, so I have uh, not included faster than light transport here because uh, A, we don't know really how to do it. Uh, Al the Alcubierre drive requires kind of uh, mat mass and energy that we don't know exists, so it's a bit problematic to construct. I also believe that if we had faster than light transport, 
colonizing the universe is the least weird problem. Uh, first of all, it's not just that we would have uh, that the Fermi paradox would become vastly bigger, because now it's not just aliens in a past life cone who could have visited us, but aliens from not just anywhere in the past, but any when, because faster than light transport means that you can travel in time too. In fact, that also means that now you can start doing computation that makes use of data from the future. And at that point, of course, you have immediate access to the internet of a uh, uh, far in the future. And the whole scenario becomes extremely weird. I actually have a section in the book where I'm uh, outlining this and saying, yeah, and I'm not going to try to build more on it. Did you, dear reader, please uh, develop this scenario in more rigorous detail if you can. <laughs> but generally, I think these are reasons to think that I can't really do it justice. It might be that actually the universe is vastly weirder than we could possibly imagine, but uh, I, I'm trying to stick to the level of where my imagination can go. Thank you, Anders, for a fascinating um, exp exp uh, well, expedition into the future of our universe. Uh, you started as a philosopher talking about values, and then you became physicist and ended up as a philosopher again, because at the end of the journey, it's just a blank sheet, actual dark sheet. Maybe it's just the consciousness. And this, I think, is the subject that you just avoided to discuss. Obviously, your agenda was, was very, very uh, packed. But let me ask you two questions. You answer essentially one of them, which is the most um, important, or rather the most imminent existential risk. You mentioned biotechnology. And I think it is the top risk, not the second one. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is imagine a, a scientist, in a, a weird scientist in a laboratory that packs a, a bacteria that doesn't exist in, the, in, in, in our space and dispersed via air, gets on the plane around the planet, and we are done. Uh, but my main uh, question to you is that you, uh, you actually fossilized, if I may use this word, the uh, development of science. Mm -hmm. You assume that we will be in our bodies in billions and billions mm -hmm. of years, which I think is a little bit unlikely. Thank yep, you. I completely agree. <coughs> I, I would be very disappointed, to be honest, if we're in our bodies in a billion years. Didn't we have any other idea in those eons? <laughs> <coughs> so I think it's pretty clear that living on Earth Human bodies are pretty nifty, although we can always find the drawbacks. But even there, I, th I think it's pretty likely that we're going to use our biotechnology to modify ourselves. Not to mention, of course, computing technologies and various forms of cyborgization. Once you live in space, it's, uh, it's very likely that it makes so much more sense to adapt to it. And especially if you start thinking about the very far future, having a body that's kind of dependent on stars or star-like uh, conditions in the degenerate era is going to be massively inconvenient. It's not implausible. Sometimes things do get fossilized. If you think about my jacket, why does it uh, look like this? It's partly uh, because this is uh, based on, uh, of course, a, a cavalry officer's uh, uniform from a few, few centuries ago. <clears throat> Our su uh, male suits are essentially weird fossilized version of uh, the military uniforms that then turn into uh, kind of something different. And uh, we might then do the same thing with other things in our culture that might become uh, stylized uh, and become part of the cultural DNA over a ridiculously long period, even though it might not be necessary. The question is, of course, whether necessities in uh, an environment are going to force us to change in various directions. I do think that, generally, as we become more powerful uh, as intelligent beings, we're better able to overcome these necessities. The sheer variety of uh, people, styles, and modes of being in this room is already bewildering compared, I think, to a uh, corresponding medieval group. Because in that society, the amount of resources to be individual, to you know, dress in a different way, to live a different life, was so much smaller. And I would expect, by a kind of extrapolation, that in a very powerful, a very rich future, we would have even more diversity. And that would presumably involve quite a lot of diversity of bodies, which incidentally, in regards to your first question, is a great idea. Because if we are different modes of living, we're not all vulnerable to the same thing. If you get brain emulations uh, and artificial intelligence, they might be vulnerable to power outages, but they're not vulnerable to biological viruses. That's great. 
And now we have a maybe two humanities and one can act as a backup for the other. Ideally, we want a million humanities, so it's very unlikely that something bad befalls all of them. Yep. So, uh, first of all, thank you. Um, I think you, you're probably very familiar with the dark forest theory. And my question would be, what's your opinion about it? And for people who don't know about what it is, it's basically a theory that says that the answer to the um, scarcity of uh, civilizations in the universe is the fact that civilizations are actually hiding in plain sight because the, it might be very dangerous to go out there and then find that somebody else is more advanced than us and then destroy humanity. So the, let's say that the solution to um, civilization just to hide and not get found out by other civilizations. So what's your opinion about that? Uh, I, I don't think it's stable uh, because it requires all civilizations to act in the same way. <clears throat> and also, the hiding civilizations, they might actually want to put up decoy civilizations uh, to see if there is something going to attack them. Um, but the ultimate answer to whether this is a reasonable uh, thing or not actually depends on the ultimate physics of violence. I actually have an appendix in my book where I'm trying to outline a theory about what does the laws of physics actually say about the limits of violence. <coughs> and it seems like there are some things we can say about uh, defender and versus attacker advantage based on what the kind of matter and energy we have. And generally it seems to be possible to always run away in space. Uh, uh, running away actually seems to be a very uh, safe strategy. Um, even running away relatively close to where you were also works because in three dimensions it's surprisingly hard to hit. Uh, so I did some calculations when, when I took a Dyson sphere and assume I use it as a giant laser weapon and I'm uh, sending a beam towards your solar system. Okay, I can vaporize your planets, no problem. But a spaceship moving around, how much do I need to play with my laser to get it? And it turns out that I need to do that for 10,000 years. That's kind of ridiculous. I got a Dyson sphere here, and I've sent this giant laser, and I can't hit a spacecraft. The problem is, of course, it's small, it's moving. I don't know where to send it because I'm light years away. And it seems that one of the interesting things about the universe, I'm not finished with this uh, line of inquiry yet, so um, I might uh, have to change it. It seems like the light speed delays, they actually are a virtue. They make it easier to hide and defend. Uh, it seems to, that they actually allow us to be in, uh, relatively certain that, yeah, you can run away. This doesn't exactly prove uh, that the dark forest uh, isn't likely. But I think, I don't believe in it very much. It also requires all sorts of civilizations to behave in the same way. And just look at us humans. Would we humans in such a situation behave in the same way? No way. There would be some humans who say, yeah, I'm going to take the risk, or I'm going to build self-replicating war machines to defend ourselves against them. It's totally unstable. I actually have a poster where I was in, uh, exploring uh, self-replicating war machines, and it turns out that they're ecologically unstable. If I have my system and you have your system, in order for you to defend against me, your machines will have to build more of themselves. And then I have to build more. And basically you get this arms race that uses up all resources. And we can be pretty certain that doesn't occur in space because we actually see resources lying around not being turned into alien war machines, which is kind of good news. Um, so I'm not too worried about the dark forest version. I think one can have something like the zoo hypothesis. Advanced civilizations take over a region and then impose the law. That might work. So it might be that they have decided, let's keep the universe uh, pristine. Let's make it look like it's natural. You're allowed to do some things, but not others. But then the next question is, of course, at what level do we step into emerging civilization and tell them what the rules are? So far, we haven't had any alien ambassadors showing up on the United Nations uh, doorstep telling them, yeah, and now here are the environmental rules for this galaxy. Uh, the, the homeowners association have some strict rules also about what you do with your moons. Um, that haven't happened yet. And there is a technical point beyond which the, uh, you better do it. And that is sending off self-replicating machines. Because beyond that point, it's very hard to keep something contained. So we're not there yet. Building a robot that can build uh, other similar robots out of asteroid material is a few decades, maybe a century away. But once you reach that point, and if nobody has shown up and told you not to do it, then you know that this can't be the explanation. Hi, thank you. Um, going back to your chart, uh, which you had different paths, uh, mm -hmm. one going straight up, one um, 
Yeah, it was yep. way back there. In terms of the likelihood of which path we take, uh, I wonder if in the near term, let's say the next couple of decades, which path we take will become more apparent or more, uh, more the one we're going to go with. And I wonder to what extent, because this room is filled with futurists, and we have futurists yep. on stage here talking about this, but the vast majority of the people in this world are probably not what you'd call futurists. They're kind of very much here in the now, we're living in the past. And I wonder to wh what extent, whether the futurist meme becomes more established in mm -hmm. society determines which one of these paths we take. And so, and whether, how much time we have to sort of get more of humanity becoming futurist in some way or another. Mm. Um, and that question, I guess, the question is really to what extent are we as civilization depending on people like Mr. Wood to, uh, mm. to save us? I think we're depending on David a lot, actually. <laughs> and it's a good point, because if you were to ask most people out in the world which path they want, I think they would actually honestly mean this one. They want the life like the one they're having, and not too different. And to some extent, that is because the thing they're cherishing is, part, uh, is framed in terms of the normal life. So you, you, know, you want to have love. And then you envision that, of course, in the form of a normal marriage, whatever that means, but not as some kind of weird polyamorous uh, Jupiter brain uh, super thing here over here. That, that might be much better, actually. But that's not how we normally think about it. In fact, most of the time, we have a very strong status quo bias. We know what we currently have. And uh, we generally tend to think that is a good thing because changes could be bad. Hence, any change, even for the better, is probably bad. So that means that I think uh, without futurists, people will be aiming very strongly for this one, except that they are always nudging it to be a little bit better. We want the house to be a little bit nicer. Uh, I want uh, the next car to be a little bit safer, faster, energy efficient, or whatever, and so on. I want my kids to be like me but better. Not alien super intelligences, but uh, little Anderses that are better be behaved and a little bit smarter, etc., etc. I think the role of futurists, it's not so much to make the urge that, oh, we should be all going up uh, along the asymptote, but rather say, look, we have options here, and some of these options might actually be quite complicated. I think we can agree that we want to avoid these ones. But what the steps needed to be done to avoid that, that needs an, another seminar, and that's going to be important. Even if we say, yeah, let's go for the mid-level, that needs a lot of things. That mid-level civilization needs to defend against asteroids and supernovas and all sorts of other weird things. So I think the real virtue in futurist thinking is recognizing that we have these options. And in many ways, there are probably m there are way more options than these particular trajectories, because I was kind of cheating by just making this a single direction. But you could argue, of course, no, we want, see, want to see technological advancement. No, spiritual advancement, more compassion, more happiness, or a thousand and thousand other things that are worth striving for. And some of these combinations are incompatible. And that's going to be a rather interesting debate. But I think as futurists, we, our role is to explain to people, look, the future is not going to be in one single direction. And we actually have quite a lot of choice here. One of the best things is to look back at history and realize how path dependent it is. So many weird events that actually changed the world permanently. That means that we can do things that change the world permanently, sometimes even deliberately. And sometimes, and hopefully often, together. Thank you. You mentioned uh, technology, collaboration, and insight as the three factors we have to navigate the risks that we face. Where do you see progress in insight coming from? Is it from new ideologies, new spiritualities, or is it only evolution that will change it? Uh, it's coming from a lot of thinking, I think. <clears throat> uh, insight is tricky because you can certainly search for insights inside a domain. And you can uh, even set out agendas. So it's something we do a lot at the FHI is that we're trying to find what we call crucial considerations, those uh, pieces of knowledge or understanding that really change the direction where you're going. <clears throat> but there are also meta insights about where can you find crucial considerations? How many should you expect? Uh, it turns out that the, the good Turing estimator in statistics allows you to make guesses at how uh, many crucial considerations might be remaining in a domain. 
But then you have those other insights that just come out of the blue from very different pers perspectives. After all, we academics, we don't have a monopoly on thinking. We're perhaps not even great at it. We just get paid for it. In fact, many people are, are uh, being paid for doing other things than thinking, but actually have to solve problems and uh, realize things. So I think one should cast one's net very broadly here. Many of the important insights uh, that have shaped our culture and civilization didn't start at the university. Abolition of slavery wasn't uh, primarily uh, something ethicists uh, invented. It began uh, in a religious framework, then it turns into an abolitionist movement. Academics flocked to it and actually gave good moral reasons, and eventually it won out. Uh, the civil rights movement, again, you can ar argue that it came from certain universal human uh, rights uh, and abstract ones. But the actual embodiment of insights in something that you can do and act on happened in a different way. I, I think uh, a beautiful example of a techno, uh, techno scientific insight is thermodynamics. We built steam engines first, then we tried to optimize them, and that's how we invented thermodynamics. It was not like we first, some scientists created thermodynamics, and then we figured out uh, that it could allow us to make steam engines. No, we built it. A lot of people with greasy fingers built them and uh, started wondering, why does this steam engine work so much better than that one? And that led to energy, enthalpy, entropy, exergy, uh, and our understandings of statistical mechanics. And I think the same thing is going to be true for insights here. We should look at practice. They quite often cause us uh, to discover things that we would never in a million years discover in the university. I, I found it exhausting, a, a lot of the numbers and the figures, because a lot of them were made with a few assumptions based on things that aren't definites, you know, things like the Big Bang Theory. Because every day our model of physics and our understanding of the world is changing. And um, what we're coming across is we're starting to see perhaps a relationship be between consciousness and the physical universe. Um, so I wonder when you talk about ancient civilizations, we seem to be alone here. Uh, because they haven't manipulated the physical universe as you would expect us with our culture. We would probably try to manipulate the physical universe, but perhaps uh, they've discovered a connection with consciousness, and perhaps <coughs> consciousness is the thing that can overcome the speed of light, the, the boundaries of the physical universe. All I can say is that um, when we dream at night, our consciousness enters a world that's uh, not bound by the laws of this physical universe. And the only reason why we give dreams less weight than um, this universe we see is that um, we have consensus right now. We're all sitting in the room and we have consensus. Where is our experience of a dream is an individual experience, yeah? But we're, we're still so far from understanding consciousness that for me, al although I do like speculating far into the future, I can't help feel exhausted and wonder if so much of this work might be in vain because a few of the premises underlying it could be proved wrong. Yeah, I, I have an entire chapter actually in my book about what if this premise is wrong. It, it's so fun actually trying to check this. But consciousness is an interesting case. First of all, you might want to try to factor very large numbers in dreams. If you're unbound by physics in dreams, you should be able to do quantum computations. And then bring, remember, if you, uh, in the morning, to actually solve actual problems. That would be a great way of proving that you can actually do uh, uh, things uh, outside the laws uh, uh, as we know them of physics. I'm very skeptical of that being doable, but it's actually worth testing, and one should take it seriously enough to try it. Uh, the, the same thing was suggested by Scott uh, Alexander uh, about people who have insight during uh, uh, psychedelic states. That okay, you ha seem to ha feel that you have access to the fundamental truth of universe. Couldn't you use that to get back some provable facts, even though they're not spiritually perhaps interesting, uh, like mathematical uh, facts, so that you could test? But I do think there is something interesting happening right now with the revolution in information physics. So 
back in, uh, in the old days, people were even disputing the idea that you could measure temperature. But what some people are arguing that temperature is a subtle thing. It can be humid, it can be hot, uh, it can involve love or not. So you can't measure it with a, temp uh, a thermometer. Gradually, we understood a bit about humidity and temperature, and we actually got that uh, semantic confusion out of the way. On the other hand, physicists would say, yeah, but talking about physics of information, that's just ridiculous. There is no link. Now we actually understand pretty well what's going on. Well, pretty well, no, I'm totally exaggerating. We have a link. Uh, there is uh, thermodynamics, statistical mechanics, quantum mechanics. It's having this really interesting synthesis right now that started with thinking about Maxwell's demon and the uh, various thought experiments, Landauer's work on uh, the thermodynamic cost of erasing information. That actually seems to imply that information is a physical thing. That is actually underlying a tremendous amount of my number crunching. Now, maybe it's the same thing with consciousness. As I did uh, in uh, my uh, point, uh, comment about love and information, I do think consciousness actually needs information processing. You can't have conscious states that actually can't affect other conscious states. So I do think that uh, it would be snared in by this consideration of information, thermodynamics, etc. So it might very well be that we're missing the most interesting part of physics, or maybe it's not even physics, but the most interesting aspect of the universe itself. Uh, but I would be very surprised if that didn't have anything to do with the stuff we already know. So when we have revolutions in physics, it's not like the previous physics stops working. We had wheels before we understood mechanics. And when Einstein reformed Newtonian mechanics, it was not like the, uh, the cogwheels in switch watches stopped working. It's just that uh, now we have an even deeper understanding of what's going on. So I do think uh, that a lot of it, my assumptions uh, are going to be relatively robust, even when we discover that maybe this is totally irrelevant, a bit like Victorians talking about steam-powered rockets uh, going to the moon. Yeah, maybe uh, the internet was more important than steam-powered rockets. And maybe it will turn out that we actually consciousness uh, and qualia are the, where it's really at. But I'm doing what I can with the tools I have right now. So. Thanks for your comment. And just to follow up on Meg's point, Anders, is it possible that in the future we'll spend most of our time in uh, lucid dreams or in uh, virtual reality rather than seeking to explore the physical reality? Well, to be honest, uh, on the train I was kind of observed that most of us were, of course, in a kind of weird lucid dream already. Uh, <laughs> in, in a sense, we are... Uh, we are creating our own mental worlds and uh, once upon a time it was dangerous to be too far into your mental world because the tiger could get you. Uh, and you really, really needed to manipulate the physical world. As we create systems that allow us to interface with the world and make it conform to our will, to some degree we can take a step back and uh, start thinking about uh, what we want or quite often, what our friends on Facebook want, and then we embed ourselves in this uh, lucid dream. So another interesting answer to the Fermi paradox uh, is, of course, maybe advanced civilizations all get trapped in their own virtual realities. Uh, they're all sitting there playing World of Warcraft or their alien version of Facebook uh, in some Dyson sphere, and uh, nobody ever noticed something. I think this is, again, unlikely, because there's always going to be some people who's going to say, no, I am going to go out there and do something real or maybe the alien Amish who say, I'm gonna use the grandfather's nanotechnology to colonize the universe like God wanted us to do, rather than spend my time here in virtual reality. So it doesn't really work well enough as an explanation of the Fermi paradox. But I think it might be a common failure mode of civilizations. Because in many ways, we can get what we want. And the curse is, of course, that uh, when you get what you want, well, that is quite often a trap because you don't know what you should want. It's easier to get what you think you want. So it's going to be important to handle this well. It strikes me that in order for these grand futures to be available, we have to get through the bottlenecks that we have immediately before us. Uh, I particularly worry about climate change. And so we're going to need to be able to have a permanent capability of learning and acting as a civilization or civilizations faster than the challenges and larger than the challenges that we face in order to be able to continuously mm. uh, endure, as it were, yeah, to, yeah. to sustain. Yeah. So yeah. how can we now grow the level of coordination mm. 
that we need in order for us at the level of our total civilizations to overcome the challenge, each of the challenges we successively face? Yeah. Great question. I wish I had an gr equally great answer to it. Um, uh, you might want to discuss this with me so I kind of write a book chapter on it. But uh, I think we have a toolbox of ways of coordinating. Some of them work better than others. We know what some of them are good for and what some of them are bad for. We also have plenty of room to uh, innovate. We have entirely new information processing tools that might allow entirely new forms of go governance and coordination. It's just that we only have had them for a few years and we have no clue on how to use them well. And some of them might have a really serious drawback. I think one way of uh, looking at it is to think about sustainability and meta-sustainability. So in normal sustainability thinking, you want to set up a society so it can sustain itself indefinitely. Except that when you look at the time scales in the literature, they're typically on the order of 100 years. Some of them go a thousand years into the future. And when you talk to the sustainability people, most of them say, yeah, but we need to get through the bottleneck now. We need to move even in the rough direction of sustainability rather than where we're currently going. So they have a point, of course. But the real thing is proper sustainability involves not just having something that works indefinitely, but that also gets updated. You might imagine an idyllic future in a society where we're all having tea with the vicar and uh, living in little uh, Miss Marple and uh, uh, Cotswold villages. That might actually make most people happy. That might be the perhaps ideal society for most people. Except that occasionally there is going to be a supernova or asteroid impact. At that point, we need a way of launching something that stops the supernova. So you need to have a system, that, uh, a framework that protects you, that also can detect and respond on the right time scale. That is going to be an interesting challenge to construct. We, we already have a few interesting tools. And uh, yes, David in his book you're writing is developing even more interesting things about trans politics. Because po the political part is part of it. The adaptation on various levels happens, both in individual levels, how we might update our lives, but also how we might actually build a civilization adaptivity. We are kind of the first civilization ever that's been both global and aware on, of its fragility in a practical sense. And we might actually want to do something. A lot of people I'm in touch with want to write repositories of our knowledge uh, or copies of Wikipedia and put it on the moon, which is great. But we want those copies to be in every school library too. We want to figure out better tools along these lines. So this is a bit rambling, unfortunately, but I think this is a key question. And uh, I do think that coming up with a bigger and better toolbox, as well as uh, getting rid of another toolbox, namely the toolbox of Moloch over there. So in a very interesting recent book, Eliezer Yudkovsky, uh, the book is called Inadequate Equilibria. And at chapter two and three, they're worth the entire book. Well, you can get it for free online, to be honest, but th those are really interesting. He's analyzing a particular case. It turns out that about a thousand uh, infants die every year in the, in the US because of something we know totally well how to treat very cheaply. How come we have this horrible situation and uh, nobody seems to be able to fix it? And he analyzes in fair detail about how the incentive structures and institutions and all the other stuff conspire to kill all these uh, poor infants. Um, now, his chapter called Moloch's Toolbox is essentially about those bad things. And we need to figure out ways of sabotaging each and every one of those tools in that toolbox. That's the opposite of building up our own coordination toolbox. We need to sabotage the anti-correlation toolbox. Hi, Anders. Um, I was going to ask something about quantum entanglement before I realized that that's actually, you can't, you can't use entanglement and entangled particles to give to the, uh, the exodus going to remote reaches of other galaxies. But I'm looking at that chart now, mm -hmm. and the issue here is the status quo bias you mentioned and the, the sort of preference that most people probably have for the permanent mid-level on the team of the vicar. Um, Given the if opportunity costs in terms of human value of not going up that exponential or, or faster curve, does that lead us to a rather uncomfortable philosophical place <laughs> where we have a moral obligation to turn futurism into a religion or a dictatorship? <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, so it depends, of course, a little bit on your value theory. Uh, but if you have the right form of consequentialism and think that you could pull it off, then you probably end up with having this very uncomfortable view. 
which is, of course, an interesting and comfortable uh, conclusion. And the question is, do one bite the bullet and start uh, f uh, figuring out how to achieve world domination? <laughs> or um, or do you want to say, oh, this is a reductio. Obviously, consequentialism, if it leads to this kind of horrible conclusion, can't be right, which I think is uh, also a woozy answer that uh, wouldn't fly in a philosophy seminar. I, I think we need to give it a lot thought, of thought. And I think, in general, people have accepted radical exponential change. If we think about all these other uh, curves, in many ways, we are already well on our way to infinity or somewhere in the vicinity, according to those curves. But they didn't uh, happen uh, exactly because uh, of some religion taking over the world. Well, maybe you could make some kind of argument that the Enlightenment industrial project predicated on the idea of progress in Christianity did take over the world in a sense. But it wasn't exactly a plan. It just happened to happen because of some things got Sorry. together in the right way. Uh, or the wrong way if you're a uh, dark green. But uh, it's, a, it's an interesting issue. What does it take to put you on a particular growth path? As critics of technology like to point out, of course, once you have a technology, it quite often have affordances that entice you to use it in particular ways. Once you have a car, you want to have infrastructure of cars. You want better roads, uh, you want lower ga uh, gas prices, you want motels, you want drive-in uh, uh, movies. And uh, you, you and others like you are setting up an infrastructure that creates vested interest. Do we have a chance to create these parapraxes, these structures that reinforce themselves before they happen? <coughs> Sometimes we do. Quite often we uh, just stumble into it. But I think we are becoming more aware of the importance uh, of these technologies. As somebody put it, uh, the laptop in, in, in is a political weapon. It, it, uh, the idea that you can put computing power in the hands of people and it's becoming portable, that actually has quite a lot of powerful implications. It's rare that somebody designs a technology for that. I think the, the, the one example I can think of is probably Bitcoin, where I'm pretty confident Satoshi Nakamoto actually wanted the kind of uh, anarcho-capitalism and felt Bitcoin was a great tool for achieving that and creating a paraprax that naturally would reinforce that. But uh, that's probably the only clear example I can come up with that where it got anywhere close to what people imagined. Essentially, you, you almost answered it already with the la last two questions, but so I will make it slightly more radical. Uh, given, for instance, uh, the election of Donald Trump, when would you say that democracy could be compounding ex existential risks? <laughs> yeah. So, so people like to uh, bang on democracy because it elects uh, stupid leaders. But that also misses uh, quite a, an important point of what democracy is for, according to political philosophers. The point of democracy is normally not to get the best leader or the best decision maker, but get representatives. And Donald Trump is unfortunately probably representative <laughs> in some sense. Uh, we want to have governments that are really well functioning, not corrupt, uh, following the rule of law, etc. But that's not necessarily part of democracy. There is something bigger and more important, that is open societies. So I think the best expression of this is David Brin's uh, The Transparent Society, which although most of the book is about the influence of surveillance and our options there, and it's amazing and prescient uh, despite being written in 96, uh, he starts out with a third uh, of the book talking about what's so good about an open society. And the point is, in an open society, anybody can say, I think that's wrong, we're doing this wrong. And if enough others agree, the rules can be updated and changed and in a centrally arbitrary, open-ended way. That doesn't mean everything do does get changed instantly. Quite often people don't listen to the people who are pointing out problems, but there is an option. Closed societies, either don't allow people to criti criticize or uh, don't allow changes. And the end result is, of course, they become fragile. Corruption cannot be rooted out, and the system uh, becomes ever worse for everybody in it, while open societies can renew themselves, sometimes in a very annoying and raucous way, and sometimes by doing a very random ex uh, exploration. So I think democracy <coughs> done badly can be an existential risk. It's worth noticing that the uh, mad uh, groups trying to end the world are very rare. There are individuals who uh, actually want to destroy the world, but they don't have the power. There are doomsday cults that await the end of the world. Uh, most of them are just w waiting for God to do it. Very few of them actually try to do it like Am Shinrikyo. 
However, there have been some groups that actually had done a very good job at increasing existential risk, and that was, of course, the American and Soviet military defense complexes. And they did it to protect national sovereignty and uh, natural security, with a regrettable side effect of maybe uh, being able to wipe out humanity accidentally. That was a regrettable side effect, which is kind of interesting. At least in America, in some sense, that complex was under democratic control, yet generated a lot of existential risk. Uh, and uh, it was not like the public noticed that this is a really bad situation. Let's vote in precedents that fix this situation. No, I maintained it. So clearly, democracy and a good political system cannot guarantee that you don't accumulate existential risk. But I do think open societies have a much better chance of fixing it than closed ones. Thank you. This is a great talk. I, I just have a, a very quick um, uh, comment. I just wanted to hear your comment. In terms of uh, diversity of the possible um, futures we could look for, because it looks to me like uh, you know, in, in, your, in your representation, it, it sort of seems that there's a convergence of all these solutions to one kind of human, one kind of future. And, and I, I worry that that one bet might be, might be a risky bet to do, yeah. and maybe we need to have uh, lots of different bets, yeah. and I, I want to just uh, know what you thought of that. Uh, totally agree. Uh, that's actually one of the big problems of trying to present these ideas, because I can only draw single lines in my diagram. Uh, that one is one line going to post-human levels, and this is one permanent middle. Obviously, it should be a whole spread. Uh, I think that if we ever get to the post-human levels, we are going to become a myriad of weird species uh, and the continua of their uh, being. And uh, that's a very good thing. And indeed, many people have this fear of transhumanism and saying, oh, you transhumans, you just want to make us all perfect and, and uh, ubermenches. Yeah, but if you listen on the ideals that uh, transhumanists have, they're all over the place what that ubermensch is. Some want to be the blonde uh, uh, guy, some want the Greek god, some want to be a Jupiter brain. That's not going to fit in uh, to one size fits all. And indeed, the diversity is probably necessary both for safety for, and for sanity and for exploration. So I do think we need to point this out, and I might actually need to make sure I point it out. Typically, it's of course easiest to write about one thing at a time because readers get so annoyed when you have 10 pages of all the options, and that's just the options I can come up with. So we have an interesting challenge for our thinking, how to think better about diversity. Thank you so much. So Anders, when is your book due? Sometimes this side of technological Sometimes singularity. Sometimes this side of the technological <laughs> singularity. And when's the technological singularity? I am not giving any dates. <laughs> not giving any dates for that. So I think we had, we had at least about uh, four books there. And when we had, uh, you seem to have about 10 to the 10 chapters to write, given yep. every time there's a hard question, you say, yeah, you've got a chapter on that. It sounds like an extraordinary piece of work. Do you have a title for the book? Uh, Grand Futures. Uh, so as a subtitle, Robin Hanson suggested, my future is bigger than yours, but I'm not going to run with that. Grand Futures, <laughs> my, my button is bigger than yours, my future is bigger than yours, yes? Yeah, well, I think it's uh, going to be our future, our future. is bigger than yes, the Yes, that's right. You also recommended David Brin's book from 1996 on the Transparent Society. Yep, it's, it's amazingly good. And then the book by Eliezer Yudkowsky, which sounds like... Yes, oh, Inadequate really Equilibrium. Inadequate equilibrium. Yeah. So Elias so is one of the biggest thinkers about uh, uh, runaway accident, uh, artificial intelligence, and he's the chief science researcher at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Yes. Yep. Yep. And he also writes Harry Potter fan stories in his spare time, which uh, help to teach people about methods of rationality. Yep. They're also very good. And finally, if you kind of like this line of big inquiry into the future, I do recommend Barrow and Tipler's The Anthropic Cosmological Principle from 86, uh, which was kind of got me on this path. That was probably the book that made me a transhumanist, started to make me think, what can we, I do to make the universe cooler? Well, I think I started reading that book in about 1986 as well, but I got yeah. bogged down after three chapters. I was too busy <laughs> doing other things. So. I've still got a bookmark in there from 1986. So come <laughs> back and finish reading this book sometime, Barrow and Tipler. Yeah. Fascinating. On the question of democracy, my own book, which is just about coming out on uh, transcending politics, argues that we need super democracy. So it's not autocracy, it's not a religion, it's not just clever people thinking. We need to go beyond the three traditional supers of uh, transhumanism. One of them is super health or super longevity, when we get our physical bodies much better. One of them is super intelligence, when we get more and more 
clever and uh, overcome our collective stupidity. The third super is super well-being, which we overcome our psychological tendencies, occasionally to depression and alienation and frustration. We reach higher levels of consciousness. But the fourth super, alongside super health, super intelligence and super well-being, is super democracy, in my view. And we must get better at uh, getting the whole of society involved in the benefits, but also in the planning of the future. So that is available for download currently. Uh, for free for the next week, as it's uh, just approaching publication. You can find that on the TransPolitica website, and I'm looking for comments on the content, and I'm also looking for endorsements, if any of you like what you read. If you want to say, we need Mr. Wood to save the future, or whatever it was, like, <laughs> but in a little bit more formal way, I don't mind having something a bit torn down <laughs> on the cover as well. Anders, you've been fantastic in leading us through uh, 10 to the 10 different considerations. Uh, you're, you're, politely, you're kindly going to be in the Marlborough Arms pub with us shortly uh, when some of these conversations can continue. I do encourage you to try and uh, make your way down there. Even if there's too big a hus uh, queue uh, around Anders, you might find that other people in the audience are actually very interesting to, to speak to as well. Uh, so it's a good crowd of people to get to know. In two weeks' time, we will have Stephen Minger in this building talking about the future of uh, healthcare, focusing on regenerative medicines, such as stem cell therapies, uh, cancer immunotherapies, 3D bioprinting, and other aspects. He's been working in this field for a very long time. He, he's a former professor at uh, King's College London. He's also been uh, immersed in large corporations such as GE Healthcare, and he has got very interesting views as to how fast we can expect these regenerative therapies to be available. So that's in two weeks' time. You'll find other details of forthcoming London Futurist events online. And in a few minutes, I might put up a rolling uh, slideshow on the screen of other things coming. But it is now time to thank Anders Sandberg very much for a, a fabulous talk. Thank you.